Hi, everybody. Welcome. 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 Hello. Welcome to ASCO Highlights with Dr. Sheba K. Thomas, part of the Global Educational Webinar Series brought to you by the International Waldenstrom's Macroglobulinemia Foundation. Today's webinar is sponsored by Selectar Biosciences. My name is Jeremy Dichter, Director of Development and Communications for the IWMF, and I'm joining you from our home offices in Sarasota, Florida. Today's webinar will examine the latest information about WM-related research featured at the 2021 American Society of Clinical Oncology Annual Meeting. Just as a reminder, there will not be a question and answer session following today's presentation, but please feel free to submit any technical questions related to your webinar experience in the Q&A box below for assistance. This presentation and all global educational webinars are made available for on-demand viewing at our website. Please visit www.iwmf.events.com to download resources from today's webinar and to visit our sponsorship page to learn more about Selectar Biosciences. For those of you unfamiliar with the IWMF, our mission is to support everyone affected by WM while advancing the search for a cure. Since 1999, the IWMF has supported over $20 million in WM-specific research, which has led to the creation of better drug therapies, resulting in deeper, longer-lasting remissions with fewer side effects. To learn more about the IWMF's research strategy, supported research projects, or to apply for WM-related research funding, please visit our website at www.iwmf.com. It is now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Sheba K. Thomas. Dr. Thomas is a professor in the Department of Lymphoma and Myeloma at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, Texas. Dr. Thomas is the principal investigator of a number of clinical trials evaluating novel therapies for patients with WM and multiple myeloma. Her clinical focus is on plasma cell disorders including WM, multiple myeloma, and primary amyloidosis. She is a member of the Scientific Advisory Committee for the International Waldenstrom's Macroglobulinemia Foundation. Dr. Thomas, thank you for joining us. Jeremy, and uh, uh, thank you for having me. I'm, uh, it's my pleasure to join you today and to share with you um, the highlights from ASCO 2021. Give me one second. I'm just going to share my slides with you. All right. Well, hopefully you can see my slides. Um, these are my, give me one second. These are my disclosures. So over the course of our time today, there are eight abstracts or research studies that were uh, presented at this year's ASCO meeting um, that we'll be reviewing. The first looks at the prognostic impact of depth of response in Waldenstrom's patients treated with what we call fixed duration chemoimmunotherapy. The next three look at various aspects of zanubrutinib. Uh, namely, uh, zanubrutinib compared with ibrutinib uh, with regard to cost effectiveness of these agents. Uh, the second looks at uh, comparing zanubrutinib with rituximab based chemoimmunotherapy uh, with regard to both efficacy and safety. And the third looks at patients who have previously had ibrutinib or calibrutinib, two different BTK inhibitors, um, but had difficulty tolerating these. Uh, and then were exposed to zanubrutinib to see if they were able to better tolerate zanubrutinib compared to their experience with the other BTK inhibitors and also how efficacious the drug was. Next, we'll look at the uh, new, a new BTK inhibitor known as TG1701, um, either alone or in combination with ublituximab and um, umbralisib. Um, is there... Uh, this is a monoclonal antibody and what's called a PI3 kinase inhibitor, respectively. We'll then move to talk about a BCL2 inhibitor uh, called Lasaftoclax. Uh, we'll then look at a radioimmunoconjugate called CLR131. 
and then we'll find we'll end by looking at uh, real world treatment patterns, cost, and healthcare resource utilization among patients with Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia who have been treated here in the United States. But in order to understand these uh, abstract the data that was presented at ASCO, I think it's helpful to sort of set up a, a context around this. And so let's first talk, talk about uh, where the state of the field is uh, today. Um, the best way to do that, it, I think, is to look at the guidelines set forth by the National Comprehensive Cancer Network. So each year, um, a group of experts in Waldenstrom's meets together and looks at the available evidence uh, from different studies that have been done in the field and puts together what they consider the standard of care treatment options um, that are available to patients. And these can be broadly categorized in as either fixed duration therapy, meaning treatment that is given for a period of time, let's say six months, for example, versus indefinite duration therapy, therapy that is started and, and continued as long as uh, a particular patient is benefiting from the drug and is tolerating it well. When we think about fixed duration therapy, the backbone of these regimens is a drug called rituximab. Rituximab belongs to a class of drugs called monoclonal antibodies, and in this case, uh, rituximab is a monoclonal antibody that targets a protein that's commonly found on Waldenstrom cells called CD20. Um, rituximab by itself is associated with a, a chance of response of about 40 to 50 percent. So a good drug, but we always want to see if we can uh, do better than just 40 to 50 percent. So often we combine it with other agents. So it can be combined with traditional chemotherapy drugs like cyclophosphamide and bendamustine. These, belong, these are uh, drugs that belong to a class called alkylating agents. Rituximab can also be combined with bortezomib, carfilzomib, or exazomib. These are drugs that belong to a class known as proteasome inhibitors. And sometimes we, use, um, we add a third drug called dexamethasone, which is a steroid. Um, to make some of these regimens even uh, more potent. Another option uh, is, to add, is to use a class of a drug, uh, drugs named fludarabine or cladribine. These belong to a class known as nucleoside analogs, and they can also be combined with rituximab. Uh, while these are very effective drugs, um, unfortunately, they are associated with about a 10% risk of causing a pre-leukemia or leukemia, or else a more aggressive lymphoma um, several years down the road from taking them. And so they are used less commonly these days than we use them at one time. On the other hand, if we look at indefinite duration therapy, we're primarily talking about a drug called ibrutinib. Ibrutinib belongs to a class known as BTK inhibitors, um, and it can be given alone or in combination with rituximab. So with that as a context, uh, let's jump into our first abstract. So this first abstract looks at the impact of depth of response on long-term outcomes, uh, outcomes like remission duration and how long, length of survival. So this study looked at uh, data from two different countries, namely the US and Italy and looked at four different cancer centers with data from four different cancer centers within these countries, and then looked at patients who had received first line chemotherapy um, in, at any one of these centers. So they looked at three different regimens, uh, rituximab with cyclophosphamide and dexamethasone, rituximab with bendamustine, or rituximab bortezomib and dexamethasone, and they uh, analyzed uh, the response at six months from the start of therapy and categorize these responses as either major responses, meaning a 50% reduction in the disease burden or more, or a 25 to 49% reduction in the disease burden, which we call a minor response. So either a major or a minor response. And then they look to see if they could um, use response to predict how long, how long uh, patients stayed in remission, 
how long it was till they needed a chemotherapy to be restarted and how long they lived overall. So in total, they, were, they analyzed data from 256 patients. Out of these, 74% achieved a major response, meaning a 50% or better reduction in their uh, disease burden from Waldenstrom's. And what they found is that when they looked at five years from the start of therapy, a greater percentage of patients uh, who uh, achieved a progression pre a five year progression pre survival, meaning that the disease was still under control five years from the start of therapy, that a greater percentage of people uh, had not needed to start a new line of therapy, and a greater percentage of people were still alive if they had achieved a major response compared to if they had achieved a minor response. That translated into about an 18 month difference in how long people lived overall uh, if they had, again, had a major response versus a minor response. So uh, I think as researchers, we take this, uh, I would take this as um, we need to get more people um, than just the 74% into a major response so that more people can um, achieve these um, better um, remission durations, time to next therapy, and uh, a higher percentage of people overall can uh, remain alive at the five-year mark. Switching gears, uh, we'll, let's take a look at some of the zanubrutinib abstracts. So this first one looks at the cost effectiveness of zanubrutinib versus abrutinib in adult patients with Waldenstrom's in the United States. So the, our cont, uh, we looked at fixed duration therapy. Now we're going to be looking at, the in, at indefinite duration therapy. So this study looked at patients who received, uh, sorry, compared patients who received abrutinib versus those who received zanubrutinib, um, another BTK inhibitor, um, because these, these drugs were compared in a phase three study known as the Aspen study. So we, have, uh, we don't often have head-to-head uh, -head comparison studies in Waldenstrom's um, because of the number of patients required to conduct such a study, but this is uh, one example where a, it was possible to conduct a, a, such a study, a phase three head-to-head -head study. So to give some background about this study, the primary objective of this study was to see whether a greater percentage of patients could achieve a 90% reduction in their tumor burden or more with zanubrutinib compared to abrutinib. And we determined that using this, the statisticians use what's called a p-value. And if the p-value is less than 0 0.05, then they say that there is a significant difference between the study arms. Now, in this case, you can see that zanubrutinib had a higher, higher percentage of the patients who received zanubrutinib achieve that 90% reduction, what we call a very good partial response or better, um, compared to those who received abrutinib, but the p-value was not less than 0 0.05, so this was not considered a statistically significant difference, meaning that uh, we shouldn't, even though the numbers are slightly different, we shouldn't interpret that as being um, significant. But while there was, it did not meet statistical significance, zanubrutinib was still effective when compared with abrutinib. So uh, you can see they had similar rates of inducing a 50% reduction or better in the disease burden. They had similar rates of uh, patients remaining uh, with good disease control at 18 months from the start of therapy. In both, uh, uh, both patients who received zanubrutinib and abrutinib, neither arm has achieved the average remission duration yet or the progression-free survival yet, meaning that the disease remains in good control for the majority of patients on both arms of the study. Where there is a slight difference seems to be with the adverse events or side effects um, that occurred on the study. So a slightly greater percentage of patients who received abrutinib had uh, side effects that led either to dose reduction or to stopping treatment compared to those who received abrutinib, zanubrutinib. Now, these are the, some of the major side effects that we look at when, uh, with regard to BTK inhibitors. Um, the, there were out of these, 
there were only two, namely atrial fibrillation and neutropenia, meaning a low bacteria-fighting white blood cell count, where there was a significant difference between ibrutinib and zanubrutinib. In the case of atrial fibrillation, there was a higher percentage of patients in the ibrutinib arm who developed atrial fibrillation of fast heart rhythm compared with zanubrutinib. On the other hand, there was a higher percentage of patients who had neutropenia, meaning a low bacteria-fighting white blood cell count compared to those who received ibrutinib. So the way I would interpret this is not that one drug is necessarily better than the other, but that they provide similar rates of efficacy, slightly different side effect profile, and this allows us to tailor our treatment to patient based on patient's needs. So if somebody who has already has atrial fibrillation, maybe we would lean them towards using zanubrutinib. Somebody who's already starting with a low white blood cell count, maybe we would lean them towards ibrutinib, something like that. But it allows for greater choice so that we can tailor treatment to a given patient's needs. So with that as context, um, let's turn to the study that was presented at ASCO. So here they looked at patients who were enrolled on this study. And on this study, in addition to looking at efficacy, they, the investigators measured quality of life. So they asked patients at the time they entered the study every three months for the first year and every six months thereafter, what their quality of life was like with regard to how mobile they were, were they able to do their normal daily activities? Did they have pain? Did they have anxiety or depression? And they, so at, they looked at these measures. They also looked at what the drug cost would be if these drugs had not been done as part of a clinical trial, but had been prescribed um, based on the prices in 2020. Um, and so what would cost have been in, uh, incurred by insurance companies um, and other payers in the United States. And then they looked also at the cost of managing side effects, routine visits, and where relevant end-of-life care um, for patients on each arm, whether they got zanubrutinib versus abrutinib. They put all of this data into a computer model and analyzed the how long people uh, were expected to live overall in each of the study arms and what quality was associated with that that year of life. Was it a good year, a good quality uh, year, or was it uh, not so good? And based on that, they gave it a score where a score of one means that you were in perfect health during that year and uh, zero, unfortunately, uh, being that you had uh, passed away. And so using this data, they uh, determined that being on zanubrutinib was associated with a slightly longer uh, length of life, a 0.94 years, almost one year. Um, and that quality associated with that year of life was 0 0.84, so a slightly higher um, quality for that extra period of time. The cost of zanubrutinib over the lifetime um, of its use would, was slightly higher, a difference of $11,132. Uh, and the authors of this study concluded that the cost of zanubrutinib was primary, the extra cost of zanubrutinib was primarily attributable to the longer period of time that patients would remain on zanubrutinib compared with abrutinib. They also stated that zanubrutinib would, was associated with lower routine care costs and end of life care costs compared with abrutinib. Uh, so I think what I would take away from this is that there, uh, I don't think the cost, when once it comes down to 11,000, because we're talking 1.5 million, unfortunately, in each arm, um, is not going to uh, sway us so much one way or the other. I think we're still going to take this back to, we have fairly, um, we have efficacious drugs, both zanubrutinib and abrutinib. I think it's really gonna come down to uh, side effects, and what patients are going to be, what a given person is going to be able to tolerate better. Um, but this does provide some food for thought um, about the life year, the slightly longer life year and quality associated life year 
for the Zanya Bruton nib arm. So something to that will need to be continued to exp be explored going further, going uh, into the future. Our next abstract uh, compares zanubrutinib with more traditional options, the, the fixed duration uh, rituximab-based chemoimmunotherapy. Uh, so in this case, zanubrutinib was compared with in a retrospective fashion, meaning that um, they went back and looked at uh, the charts of patients who had been treated with either zanubrutinib or with rituximab, cyclophosphamide, dexamethasone, or rituximab, bendamustine, and compared the efficacy um, and safety of each of these regimens. So uh, there was one study done uh, with zanubrutinib that involved 102 patients. There was another study with bendamustine, rituximab, and a third study with dexamethasone, rituximab, cyclophosphamide. So they analyzed the data from each of these studies, and they tried their best to match, uh, to find similar patients um, who had been treated um, on each of these studies, and they tried to match them sort of based on their age and based on various uh, disease features. And so what they found, sorry, and I'll just step back. So this is, uh, just for clarity, this is the data comparing the zanubrutinib with dexamethasone, rituximab, cyclophosphamide. This is the data comparing zanubrutinib with bendamustine rituximab. And what you can see, this is this PFS refers to progression-free survival, meaning how what the disease control rate or maintaining disease control. And they looked at, at the 12-month mark and at the 24-month mark. And what you can see is that when they, again, these are patients matched as best as they could. Um, more patients seem to um, maintain good disease control uh, who receive zanubrutinib compared with dexamethasone, rituximab, cyclophosphamide, and more patients uh, likewise in zanubrutinib compared to bendamustine rituximab at the two-year mark. This held out uh, with regard to overall survival, length of survival as well, so that more patients uh, remained alive 94% remained alive at, two, at the two-year mark who had received zanubrutinib compared to 85% with dexamethasone, rituximab, cyclophosphamide, and 88 versus 77% when comparing zanubrutinib with bendamustine, rituximab. So a benefit on both, uh, in both, um, with zanubrutinib in comparison to both of the rituximab chemotherapy uh, regimens. When you compare side effects, there was not a significant difference between zanubrutinib and dexamethasone, rituximab, cyclophosphamide. Uh, however, when compared with bendamustine, rituximab, um, BR was associated with a higher rate of the uh, neutropenia, meaning the low bacteria fighting white blood cell count. It was bendamustine, rituximab was also associated with a higher rate of uh, pneumonia compared with zanubrutinib. Our third abstract uh, looks at uh, zanubrutinib in patients who could not tolerate ibrutinib or acalabrutinib. And this study looked at patients who had received, uh, who had some of whom had Waldenstrom, some of whom had other blood cell cancers. So again, we're going to uh, compare uh, ibrutinib and, sorry, uh, we're looking here at ibrutinib and another BTK inhibitor, acalabrutinib and then comparing those um, to zanubrut, or looking at patients who had prior exposure to ibrutinib or acalabrutinib, and then trying uh, zanubrutinib in these patients. So they gave patients with zanubrutinib a total of 320 milligrams per day, either as a once daily dose or as a twice, as a split dose morning and evening. And they asked the question, when patients who had previously been intolerant of ibrutinib or acalabrutinib were given zanubrutinib, did they have recurrence of the side effects that they had had and that made them come off of the previous drugs? And did they have any new side effects that hadn't been seen with ibrutinib or acalabrutinib? So in total, there were 44 patients on this study. 34 of them had chronic lymphocytic leukemia and then four of them had other lymphomas, um, but six had Waldenstrom's. Out of these 44 patients, the major, vast majority had, uh, had prior ibrutinib exposure. 
uh, four had had both a brutinib and a calibrutinib, and one had just had a calibrutinib alone. Among these 44 patients, 80s, there were 87 side effects um, that led to discontinuation of a brutinib and nine side effects that led to discontinuation of a calibrutinib. And what they found is that of these 87, 72 did not recur when they uh, were given zanubrutinib, and of the nine with the calibrutinib, seven did not occur, reoccur when uh, treated with zanubrutinib. So that's, uh, that was quite an improvement. Interestingly, of the 17 side effects that did reoccur with treatment of zanubrutinib, 14 occurred at a lower severity score. So it seems that zanubrutinib may have, uh, even if it did cause side effects, seemed to be more tolerable. There were six patients on this study who required uh, a break from treatment. Um, there were two patients where a dose reduction of zanubrutinib was required, but there were no side effects that occurred on this study where zanubrutinib has had to be stopped. Now, granted, this, the patients have only been followed for an average of 4.2 months, so it may take longer to um, see if that re remains the case, but at least early on, this seems to, this is uh, promising data, and no patients have died on this study. Interestingly, 61% uh, of patients have had a deepening of their disease response on zanubrutinib. 38% uh, or 39% have maintained the response that they had going into the study. There have been side effects with zanubrutinib. 21% uh, of patients have had some muscle aches, 18% have had bruising, and 16% each have had dizziness and fatigue, and 11% have had a cough. Okay, let's take a moment of uh, break, and then uh, we're gonna switch gears and talk about uh, a new BTK inhibitor um, called TG1701. So this is a study coming from Australia, uh, and this was studied alone, as well as in combination with two drugs, ublituximab and umbrellacid. So again, uh, getting back to our context slide. So TG1701 belongs to the BTK inhibitor class. It is a next generation BTK inhibitor. So it is designed to hopefully overcome some of the drug resistance that can develop with ibrutinib by working in a slightly different way. Uh, so in this study, um, the, uh, they looked at TG1701 by itself, as well as in combination with ublituximab and umbralicin. Um, for the patients who got TG1701 alone, they looked at four different dose levels. And then uh, once they had established a safe dose on the TG1701 by itself, they also looked at the three drugs together and all patients were treated until the disease had uh, progressed. Um, all of the patients who with Waldenstrom's received the 200 milligram dose of TG1701. Um, so as I mentioned, there, there were patients treated uh, with, a diff with several different um, B cell malignancies, several different blood cell cancers. Um, and here they've broken out the patients who have had chronic lymphocytic leukemia, mantle cell lymphoma. So we're gonna focus on this third group the, uh, in the gold um, who all had Waldenstrom's macroglobin anemia. So there were 20 uh, Waldenstrom's patients who were enrolled on this study and who got the TG1701 as a single drug. Eight of these patients had had no prior therapy and none of the patients had had a prior BTK inhibitor, nothing in the abrutinib class of drugs. 95% um, of these patients had at least a 25% reduction in their disease burden or better and 70% had at least a 50% reduction or better. So that's sort of comparable to what we have seen with ibrutinib, acalabrutinib, zanubrutinib. As far as the side effect profile, among all 123 patients across all the different blood cell cancers who were treated on the study, 4% had atrial fibrillation, including one patient that had a more severe case. Um, there were 2% of patients who had more severe um, high blood pressure, and 19% of patients had some bleeding tendency, but these tended to be mild. 
6.5% of patients had side effects that required a dose reduction, and 1.6% had side effects um, leading to stopping the drug. So it was a fairly low percentage, and this was related to atrial fibrillation and COVID in, in this patient. In addition to the single arm study, um, this is data with uh, the TG1701 in combination uh, with what we'll call U2, the combination of these two drugs. Um, and I'll focus your attention here at the, um, again, at the gold, the Waldenstrom's patients. So there were three Waldenstrom's patients treated with the three drug combination. Um, and what you can see is the CR refers to complete remission. So all three Waldenstrom's patients treated with the three drugs together achieved a complete response. Uh, so this is, uh, although it's certainly very small numbers of patients, um, it certainly bears watching um, this combination to see how, how this uh, regimen unfolds as more patients are added. The most common, um, uh, more uh, severe side effects were low white blood cell count seen in about a fifth of patients. Um, there were also um, increased liver enzymes in about a fifth of patients um, for one of these liver enzyme tests and about 16% in the other liver enzyme tests. So things that need to be followed, um, but again, these are pretty exciting, if small, if early um, response data. So we'll switch gears yet again, and now we'll uh, move to talking about a BCL2 inhibitor. So this is a drug known as lasaftoclax, lasaftoclax rather, uh, uh, in, and this was studied in Waldenstrom's as well as a few other um, uh, blood cell cancers. So we're going to move to uh, using our context slide. We're going to look at the indefinite duration therapy, and we're going to add um, this class of drugs, BCL2 inhibitors. Some of you may be familiar with the drug venetoclax. Uh, so this is a related drug, lasaftoclax. So why are BCL2 inhibitors interesting? So BCL2 is a protein that is highly expressed on Waldenstrom cells, particularly in patients who have a gene mutation known as mid-88 that is quite common in Waldenstrom's. Um, when it's st been studied in the lab, venetoclax causes the Waldenstrom cells to die. And that's been true either e whether or not patients have had a prior exposure to ibrutinib or, or not. So there was a study done with venetoclax a few years ago uh, where 31 patients were enrolled. Uh, on average, they had had two prior therapies and half of them had had prior ibrutinib or another related drug. And what they found is that 81% of these patients treated on the study had at least a 50% reduction in their tumor burden. So it's quite a, quite a high response rate for a pill that is taken um, daily. The average time to response was about two months. It was a slightly, uh, was slightly longer than that for patients who had had prior ibrutinib or related drug. The side effects that were seen with venetoclax, um, or the most notable side effects seen with venetoclax, were neutropenia, meaning that low white blood cell, low bacteriophyting white blood cell count. And this was seen either grade three or grade four, so pretty significant um, levels of uh, low white blood cell count seen in about 20 out of the 31 patients. Um, other significant side effects included um, anemia in four patients and diarrhea in four patients at, again, the sort of more significant level. And these side effects led to dose reductions in five patients, um, two for neutropenia, one for fatigue, one for diarrhea, and then one patient chose to reduce the dose on their own because of um, the side effects that they were experiencing. So with that as background, uh, lisaftoclax is a new drug in the same class. Um, it is thought that it may have a better side effect profile compared to venetoclax, and so that's part of the interest in studying it. Um, because we know that venetoclax is an effective drug now, if we can make it make the side effect profile better, um, that, that would be great. Um, so this study assigned patients to one of two cohorts. One cohort was for patients with chronic lymphocytic leukemia. The other cohort was for patients with other blood cell cancers, including Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia. Um, in each of the cohorts, 
they started at a low dose and as patients tolerated, they explored higher dose levels. And then when the goal is to once they achieve, once they reach a dose level that is safe and tolerable in effect, then they want to uh, expand, uh, include more patients, uh, study more patients at that safe and tolerable level. And patients on this study are to be treated as long as they are responding well and tolerating the drug. So this is indefinite duration treatment. As far as the side effects um, that they've seen so far, um, and this is including patients not only with Waldenstrom's but with other blood cell cancers, um, they do see some fatigue and uh, low bacteria fighting white blood cell count, though only 14% had the more significant levels of uh, the low bacteria fighting white blood cell count. You can see that the levels of other uh, side effects, uh, particularly at the more intensive level of side effects, were fairly low, um, 3% for fatigue, diarrhea, nausea, and low platelet count. Now, I mean, this slide is a little bit busy because it shows the response data for uh, patients who uh, had any type of blood cell cancer that were treated on the study. So I'm gonna focus your attention um, on the sky blue color. These are the five patients with Waldenstrom's who uh, were treated on the study. And what you can see that uh, is that uh, this arrow refers to patients who remain on study. Um, this star refers to somebody who's achieved a partial response, uh, so at least a 50% reduction or better. There are two patients who have come off of the study, one for side effects, one for disease progression, but the other three patients remain on study and so appear to be benefiting from their treatment. So because of this early um, data that suggests that it may be effective in Waldenstrom's, um, the, the company is now, has now launched a three-arm study of this drug specifically for Waldenstrom's patients. Um, they are enrolling patients who, are pre who have previously not had um, any therapy. So that, is, that arm of the study will receive lisaptoclax with ibrutinib. There is also an arm for people who have relapsed disease but have and have had a prior ibrutinib type drug, uh, a prior BTK inhibitor, and th that arm will get lisaftoclax alone. And the third arm is for patients who have relapsed Waldenstrom's but have never had a prior uh, BTK inhibitor, and that arm will receive lisaftoclax with rituximab. And treatment will continue until disease progression or uh, unacceptable uh, side effects. Our next study uh, looks at the drug CLR-131. So this belongs to a new class of drugs um, called radioimmunoconjugate. So this is a fixed duration therapy um, drug, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about the dosing in just a second. So the way that um, this drug works is different from anything that's, uh, that we've talked about so far. Um, it takes advantage of the fact that tumor cells need fats, need lipids, um, and they need them at rates that are, that are significantly greater than what normal cells use, and they use them as an energy source. So this drug goes and looks for these collections of fats in the tumor cells and binds to those fatty areas. And that allows the, then al that allows the uh, drug to get taken up into the tumor cells where it then delivers a um, radioisotope called I-131, iodine-131, um, and uses that to kill the tumor cell. This is a, iodine-131 has been used for many years, uh, particularly in the treatment of thyroid cancer. Um, so this is a, a known, um, a, known uh, drug that is has been studied, um, but this particular delivery system um, of using this, um, this the platform that uh, the Selectar folks have developed, that, that is certainly novel. So this study, uh, the goal of the study is to enroll 50 patients, um, and the patient, patients who are eligible have received at least two prior lines of treatment. And they, at the, uh, when the study was published, they were required to have either failed or had a inadequate response to a prior BTK inhibitor. All patients on the study received four doses of the study drug, 
um, given over a two month period of time. And the goal is to uh, look at safety as well as to look at the chance of having a response and then longer term outcomes like how long does the response last and how long is it till another treatment is required. Thus far, six patients have been enrolled to the study. All patients have, uh, were, who enrolled on the study had, as I mentioned, either were no longer responsive to abrutinib or had a, a less than adequate response to it. 83% um, of these patients uh, were either refractory to rituximab, meaning they were no longer responding to rituximab-based combinations either a pretty uh, difficult to treat uh, group of patients, you might say. And what they have found with this drug uh, in the six patients um, that have uh, been enrolled on the study is that all of the patients have had a response. Out of the six, five have had at least a 50% reduction in their tumor burden or better, including one patient who has had a complete response to therapy. Um, and we don't see very many uh, drugs that have produced complete responses to therapy. So to see the TG1701 in combination with the U2 um, achieve three uh, complete responses and to see this drug uh, now also uh, produce a complete response, that's uh, exciting. So not only did uh, has this drug shown responses in all of the patients that have uh, been treated with who have Waldenstrom's, Five of, for five of six of the five out of six of these patients, uh, the response has been on is ongoing, meaning only one patient has had to come off uh, treatment and to uh, receive other treatment. The average time to that partial response mark or better was 44 days, so about a month and a half. And the, the average duration of remission has not yet been reached, meaning that patients are maintaining uh, good disease control so far. As far as side effects go, uh, most of the side effects appear to be related to low blood counts, um, white blood cell counts, hemoglobin, platelets, uh, sort of, uh, but they uh, occur in a very um, typical, uh, sorry, predictable fashion. So they seem to, the lowest point of the blood count seems to be around 34 days from the first dose of drug, and there is a expected recovery about three weeks later. So far, they have not seen any treatment-related deaths, heart problems, liver, kidney, or, or um, central nervous system problems, and neither are they seeing any problems with, related to the eye. So what I hope I've shown you so far is that we have um, a number of classes of drug, drugs and classes of drugs that have been under study, and this is only a fraction of um, the drugs that are currently being studied in Waldenstrom's. Um, I'm going to turn our attention now to looking at cost. So this last abstract uh, looks at real-world treatment patterns, um, cost, and healthcare resource utilization in the United States. So to look at this, uh, the authors looked at data, at Medicare and insurance claims data that were submitted for people who have Waldenstrom's between the years of 2014 and 2019. And they added up the total cost of inpatient care, outpatient care, and drug costs per patient per month. They also looked at what treatments uh, those patients received, how often they were hospitalized, um, and sorry, how often they were hospitalized, what percentage of the patients were hospitalized, and for how many days they were hospitalized. And what you can see is that patients received a variety of different treatments. Um, many patients received rituximab as a single drug. Others received uh, rituximab in combination with chemotherapy or with uh, the proteasome inhibitors, so different fixed duration regimens. Still others received ibrutinib, although ibrutinib seems to be more commonly to more commonly have been used in uh, the second or third lines of treatment. And still other patients received different regimens altogether. 
what they found is that among 452 patients that they analyzed who had received first line chemotherapy, um, the average cost per month was about was close to $19,000. Um, this was true among those who received second line chemotherapy as well. You can see their numbers get a little bit small once we get to third line therapy. So the average cost was quite high at 36 or nearly 37,000. But um, I would take this with a grain of salt since there were only 24 patients in this um, in this part of the study. Um, because then, uh, you know, small uh, if one or two patients had quite high cost, this could skew the numbers a bit. The 17 and 20 percent of patients, uh, respectively, were hospitalized um, among the first and second line uh, chemotherapy um, arms. Those who had received among those who had received third line chemotherapy, the hospitalization rate um, was 25 percent. And you can see the length of hospitalization. The average length of hospitalization was quite a lot higher. Um, in patients, among patients who received third line chemotherapy. But again, with the small numbers of patients, one or two patients could really skew this number quite a bit. So I would take this third line with a little bit of a grain of salt. But I think what we can take away and what we can all probably agree on is that these costs of these per patient costs per month uh, are quite a burden and uh, certainly something that ASCO, ASH, and many of uh, the IWMF and, and many other organizations are um, realizing it's coming more to the forefront of as, a, as an issue that needs to be addressed. So uh, with that, I will use that as a lead in to say that there are many, um, the IWMF, the Leukemia Lymphoma Society, and uh, many other organizations want to help um, with regard to uh, providing financial assistance. Um, this is information that I got from the IWMF website. And so um, please uh, don't hesitate to reach out to the IWMF if you need financial assistance resources. They have a lot of good information on their website uh, for how, um, for organizations that can be helpful. Um, there are some of the drug companies also have um, financial assistance programs that you may be able to avail yourselves of. Um, so don't hesitate to look into these. And finally, I'll put in a plug for Whimsical. Uh, for those of you who uh, may not know, Whimsical is the only global Waldenstrom's registry of patient-derived data. So this is a uh, database that you as patients can contribute your information to. Um, it's information about what treatments you've had, how you've responded, what your quality of life is like, various other questions. And it allows um, for, a, for a centralized uh, database of data from around the world. Um, and that the numbers that that can generate um, is much greater than any one uh, hospital or, or medical center can generate. And so uh, I would encourage you to contribute your data um, to help all of us in our efforts to find new treatments and uh, better ways of treating uh, Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia. Um, the authors uh, or the, the investigators uh, who are behind uh, Whimsical, they are hoping to submit an abstract, uh, some data to the American Society of Hematology meeting in December. So they did ask that if you're if you are already if you are one of the 520 participants who are already participating, if you are able to update your data by mid July, that would be of great help to them. If you are not already participating, uh, you can join the Whimsical Registry at this website www.cart-wheel.org. And if you need more information um, to help you decide, um, you uh, this link or this email address. Uh, can be used to access more information. Um, and with that, uh, these are my colleagues at MD Anderson. Um, if any of us can ever be of help to you, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out. My email address is provided at, at the bottom of this email, um, and uh, we're, we are always um, available to, to help you if we can. Thank you for your attention. 
Uh, thank you so much uh, for that incredible presentation, Dr. Thomas. It, this has been an absolute pleasure. This was a ton of information. And so I, I want to remind folks uh, that to, to view additional resources and slides from today's presentation, please uh, visit www.iwmfevents.com. Uh, and while we don't have a question and answer session scheduled for today, I encourage you all to please continue this conversation uh, at IWMF Connect. Um, thank you to our audience for joining us today and to Select Our Biosciences for their sponsorship uh, and support of today's global educational webinar. The IWMF serves the entire WM community with support groups across the nation and around the globe, offering free support and educational services to whomever, wherever, whenever needed. This is only possible thanks to the generous financial support of people like you. So if you value the educational programs and initiatives brought to you by the IWMF, please consider a gift of support today. On behalf of the entire WM community, thank you for joining us. And until next time, be well. <laughs>